from his childhood story to his medical breakthrough that restores sight in millions of blind people. My guest today is sure to inspire you. Hear Dr. Ming Wang's story firsthand before you can see it in theaters on this episode of the Contagious Influencers of America. I was able, as the eye doctor, come out of my own darkness of suffering in the past into light as well. Imagine you're blind. All you see is darkness, but a miracle happens. And on May the 24th, this incredible story called Sight is coming to theaters. And welcome to CIA, Contagious Influencers of America. I'm David Sams. I'm so excited to bring you uh, this guest today. He's actually a personal friend. He's a world-renowned eye surgeon, and he has developed technology that has literally given folks back their sight. I'm talking about millions of people across the world are now able to see because of the miracles that uh, this guy's technology has developed. And uh, it's going to play out in a big screen movie from Angel Studios in just a few days. Uh, Yes, the uh, studio that brought us uh, Sound of Freedom and His Only Son, they're releasing this movie. And I'll tell you, I've seen it a couple of times and it brought tears to my eyes, uh, I I mean, throughout the movie. I mean, this is, make sure you bring your Kleenex because when you see... When you see the the uh, the children, when you when you see the the eyesight restored in uh, just beautiful children who could not see, and I'm not going to tell you why they can't see because that's another story. But you're going to see it in the movie. Uh, you're just going to be uh, so incredibly moved. The movie stars Greg Kinnear and Terry Chin, and it's in theaters beginning May the 24th. And uh, you know, uh, Dr. Wang, he's a, a Chinese immigrant. Uh, who draws upon his grit and determination that he gained from a very turbulent childhood to restore the sight uh, of a blind orphan. And then it just was a domino effect of of goodness. So this is going to be great. It's in theaters May the, uh, let let me see here, May 24th. That's right. And uh, I encourage you to see it. And I want to, I want to applaud Angel Studios and of course the, their guild of members uh, who who chose, who voted to put this movie in theater. So uh, a big uh, a big thank you to uh, Angel Studios. So let's get right to my interview with uh, my friend, uh, Dr. Ming Wang. Dr. Wang, welcome. Thank you, David. I wanted to have you here for such a long time, and here you are right here in the uh, Homestead studio. Thank you. And uh, boy, the uh, the timing couldn't be uh, better. I, I wanted to have you here for years, but now your movie's about to come out. Yes. So it's God's timing. Yes. <laughs> yes, indeed. I I want to go back to the very beginning of your story in a minute, but uh, first of all, what what's it like seeing yourself on the screen? I mean, is that like surreal? Yes, David. It's indeed and surreal, and also a very humbling experience to see such a world class cast and crew and who are ultimate professionals with such a great quality of their artwork and their profession that devote their time and energy and creativity in making a film that depicts my life story and uh, my uh, journey from darkness to sight. It's truly a humbling experience. And what a cast. Yes, we have Greg Kinnear, and uh, who nom- nominate who was nominated for an Oscar many years ago, and also Terry Chang who played me. You know, when they recruit the um, talent to play me, they said, "Me, what are your criteria?" I said, two criteria." They said, "What are they?" I said, "Young." and good looking. And they say, why? I say, well, it's a bio- biopic film. It needs to be truthful. <laughs> <laughs> See, he was in, uh, Terry, he was in, uh, what was it, Almost Famous. Mm-hmm, I yeah, think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, Greg Kinnear was in As Good As It Get with Jack Nicholson oh, I mean, and Harry Hunter. <laughs> a classic, <laughs> yeah, classic. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I will tell you something a little crazy. Years ago, I'm talk, I'm going back, uh, gosh, what, 19, early 90s? Mm-hmm. Greg, I, I lived in uh, I lived in uh, Hollywood, mm. and Greg Kinnear was just sort of starting out. 
uh, I think he was doing uh, that that E show, or maybe mm-hmm. he was about to. I don't I don't remember what uh, the context, but but I remember his agent sent him over to my house to do a an audition. Uh, at that time, we were having uh, auditions for for this overnight TV network thing we were going to mm. do, and I was looking for these uh, these quirky characters. Mm-hmm. And Greg Kinnear was not Greg Kinnear yet. <laughs> yes, okay. <laughs> and I still have that tape somewhere. Mm-hmm. It's on one of those high eight tapes. <laughs> so it's that's really cool. Um, uh, uh, just tell me, why do you think your story makes a great film? Why do you think it's going to speak to people's hearts? Yes, and the movie site, based on my autobiography from darkness to sight, is trying to bring back that hope and to show that don't be limited by where you are now. Believe and imagine where you could be tomorrow. Mm. Don't be limited and frustrated by your present circumstance, but believe that we can overcome it and there's a brighter tomorrow. So it's a message of hope that the world needs so much today. Second reason that uh, the site, the message that I think the world also needs is we are so unprecedentedly polarized. We are increasingly fixated on our differences rather than appreciating what we have in common. An increased fixation on power alliances rather than the merit of issue. The interest of people and nation should be up Above the interest of any political parties. So at the time of unprecedented hyperpolarization of our nation, this virus of polarization, what's the vaccine against that? The vaccine against the virus of polarization, in my opinion, is common ground. Hmm. It's for us to be more willing to seek what we have in common rather than fixate it on our differences. So what's the motivation? Be that it will drive us, motivate us to see common ground as fellow Americans. That motivation has to come from the appreciation of God's blessing to us in America, the ability to for us to live in this wonderful country with freedom and liberty. We cannot take for granted. Taking for granted the blessing, being able to live in America, is the main reason why we are so fixated on our differences and so unwilling to seek common ground. And you of all people would uh, understand that uh, taking for granted because uh, you, you, well, let's start from the beginning of your story, where that, where that began. The movie Sight is based on my autobiography from darkness to sight. And it's a story of many of my patients from darkness to sight because I'm an eye doctor, I've been helping them. But also it's a journey of myself from darkness to sight. Uh, I was born in China grew up during Cultural Revolution. Uh, 19- and, and explain what that, that was. Yes. Cultural Revolution it was really a crazy time in China from 1966 to 1976. For 10 years, the government shut down, shut down all universities and colleges of entire China for 10 years and forcefully deported every single high school graduate to some of the poorest part of the country and condemn each one of us a life sentence of hard labor and poverty. Over 10 years of Cultural Revolution, um, from 1966 to 1976, by having shut down all universities and colleges for that 10 years, they sent away to labor camp 20 million young people. Mm. So I caught that. In 1974, I was 14 years old. I finished my ninth grade. I grew up in a very poor family. The combined salaries of my parents every month were only $15. So mom and dad always said, study hard, study hard. Education was the only way to get out the poverty. Actually in the film side, you see the scene where we didn't have enough to eat. We were going hungry. And as, as a six year old, seven year old, I was asking, do we have more rice? And mom and dad said, we don't. But despite the poverty and the subsist condition, they still believe in me that see something special in me, say, mean, study hard, study hard. So I studied really hard. Uh, 1974, I was 14, I finished my ninth grade, and I was looking forward to attending 10th grade and beyond when the deportation order came down to me. Not just me, 20 million others. I got kicked out of school, and I was never allowed to go back. 
and are faced with this devastating fate being sent away to labor camp for life. In order to avoid that, I found out that if I could play a music instrument, or if I could dance, I might be to get into what they called communist uh, government song and dance propaganda troupe. If I could do that, I might be able to be uh, spared from being sent away to labor camp, being allowed to stay in the cities, because government still needed musicians and dancers for its song and dance propaganda troupe in the cities. So I, staying, I started playing a Chinese violin, Erhu, a uh, two-string Chinese uh, instrument. Actually, it was depicted in the film Sight also. And uh, the entire film was uh, carried this beautiful music with this traditional Chinese violin, Erhu. And I remember I was playing a piece written by a blind artist who was born blind, who had never seen. So all he could do is imagine how beautiful it could have been if he could see. So it's a piece called Two Springs Reflecting the Moon, and the, the piece was also played in part of the movie site also. So at age 14, I should be looking towards the future of excitement and the future of possibilities. I, like 20 million others, were condemned to the bottom of the society, losing all hope for the future. The, and playing his piece, Two Springs Reflecting the Moon, he could not see physically as a blind composer, I, playing his piece, could not see mentally any future. So, it's interesting, uh, David, that here in Nashville, sometimes friends come and tell me, say, oh, Ming, it's so nice, you have a hobby, you can play instrument, you can dance, you know, I love ballroom dancing. And my answer is that I didn't learn music and dancing for fun, for love of music or art. I learned them to survive. So I try everything, music, dancing, all fail, though, my fate was labor camp. When I was about to be sent away, I got lucky. 1976, I was 17, the dictator died and cultural revolution ended. So government reopened all the colleges. They realized what a tragic mistake it has made by shutting down all universities and colleges for 10 years from 1966 to 1976 by sending away to labor camp 20 million young people for life. So they stopped the Cultural Revolution, reopened all the colleges, and mom and dad came home one day, they said, Ming, you might be to go back to school. I thought I would never be able to hear that in my lifetime. I said, when? Mom said, maybe tomorrow. I said, well, should I go back to ninth grade? Uh, uh, dad said, no, you go higher. I said, I've never studied any other, you know, I, I, I was uh, kicked out after ninth grade three years ago. He said, no, you go back to school directly to 12th grade overnight. Never studied 10th, 11th, 12th. Wow, wow, wow. So so you skipped from the 9th to the 12th grade. Yeah. And you were trying to be a musician and a dancer in between. In between, trying to escape labor camp. Try, yeah. And uh, the, w that was not successful because government discovered I was playing music instrument and learning dancing with an ulterior motive. <laughs> really not for music dancing, but to avoid being late. So now, now, could they tell that because of the way you danced and played? or <laughs> No, to be, uh, uh, because the way I was... Uh, studying it and uh, I was so keening on applying for the song and dance propaganda troupe. Oh, so they realized okay. that that was all I wanted and uh, to try to escape being sent away to labor camp. Oh, so okay. they actually stopped my music practice dancing practice. Oh, all right. So you were trying too hard. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so my, my, so cultural revolution ended and my parents want me to jump straight ahead from 9th to 12th, ne having never studied 10th, 11th, 12th. And I asked my dad, why? He said only 12 graders allowed to participate in the college entrance exam. The first college entrance exam in China in 10 years. Mm. So all university college was shut down for 10 years. So I was so stressed out, how could I do that? And I said, why sh should I do that? I mean, why do I wait for three years? You know, actually depicted in the film side, the, the character, me asked that question. And mom said, you don't know what will happen next year. They could shut down university again for another 10 years. So I knew I had to do it. But I was so stressed, how could I do that? Jumping three years ahead, you know, overnight and into 12th graders from 9th to 12th and compete against other 12th graders for their 1% chance of getting to college. Mm. So mom and dad helped me. They borrowed some old review questions. But we were very poor that, you know, their combined salaries every month were only $15. We didn't have money to copies or Xerox. So when mom and dad did, they found little pieces of papers throughout the house, hand copied those questions 
onto little pieces of papers, and every night drill me with little pieces of papers containing those review questions. They made me study 19, 20, 21 hours a day. Mm. I almost killed myself studying. Mm. My autobiography from Darkness to Sight, from which the film Sight is based, talk about when I eventually made to the examination building on the day of the exam, uh, I almost collapsed from exhaustion. I did barely got into college, but I did not have anything to do with the dictator. So 1982 was $50 borrowed from a visiting American professor. And this professor was also depicted in the film Sight also. And when I met him first time, I was trying to impress him because I was trying to get his help to come to America. So I, the night before I met him, I spent all night preparing a question so I could with all my almost non-existent English, trying to impress this visiting American professor. But next day I asked him that question, he did not understand it. And he kept asking me to repeat. And all I had could do is, with my limited English, all I could do is keep on repeating the same question. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the question was, what's the academic load of your school? This was depicted in the film site. And he couldn't understand. And then later I realized that I did study hard the night before by pulling out the textbook to study to impress him so next day I can so I could be helped by him to come to America. But what I did not realize is that I pulled out the English, British English textbook, not American English. <laughs> so the way the question was phrased, this American professor had no idea what I was asking. But I accomplished what I set out to do. I did ask the question. So, um, and I kept on repeating the same question eight, nine times until he finally understood he was not really impressed by my English or lack of, but he was impressed by my tenaciousness. So he said, that kid, I want to see him in America. That's how I came, 1982, with $50 bottle from him, with a Chinese English dictionary, uh, with a student visa, knowing no one in this country could hardly speak English, even though I was nearly penniless, but I was happy. Why? I was free. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, so you got here with fifty bucks. Yes. How can you survive on fifty dollars? What happened? I had to quickly get a job as a teaching assistant, and I have to learn English very, very quickly in a matter of weeks. So, how could you study English quickly? And also, not just the language; you have to learn the culture. You know, uh, even though you know English, but if someone say Joe DiMaggio, you have to know who is that. You know, in what context? So I thought. How could I learn English quickly and the culture at the same time? I figured out a way, watching movies. Mm. So I went to a little bro- uh, rundown theater in Washington, D.C. called Biography, and um, the, you could watch two movies, one dollar. So I watched so many of uh, classic Hollywood movies, so I learned the language and the culture very quickly. This is before Netflix. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Uh, I also read somewhere that you discovered uh, the... Uh, the uh the blessing of the uh, Salvation Army. Yes, <laughs> we. I arrived with two other guys, and um, my parents spent two months of their sal- uh, salary to buy me a suit. That's all I had when I came to America. One, I have a suit, but that's all I had. So three of us arrive on American campus. Uh, we may be the three poor st- students, but we are the, actually the best dressed. <laughs> but uh, we didn't have anything else. But we were laughed at by people who said, oh, these three guys look weird. So we said, we got to Americanize quickly. So I only had like $12 by them. I spent the rest on the ta- cab drive. Um, then I said, oh, how could I get American clothes with my $12? Salvation Army. So we went to the Salvation Army, and I bought like used clothes like for $0.75, cents, $0.50. Cents. And this scene was also depicted in the film site also. So next day, we show up on the university campus, uh, dressed totally like Americans. But we surprised to me that we got more laugh this time, even. And what happened was that even though we did dress like Americans, but we were were wearing clothes that people used to wear in the late 1960s. Oh, like bell bottoms. (laughs) Yes, yes. (laughs) Take care of bright colored uh, shirts. So people joke that you turned from yuppie to hippie. But that's you, how you I didn't buy him. a dashiki, did you? Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I have dashikis. I have a oh, whole collection. <laughs> well, so it's a humble beginning, but mm-hmm. it was fun. And if I remember that, um, you know, the first time I went 
you know, I had few dollars left, and I wanted. I was so hungry, and I went to McDonald's, and、um, I had the Big Mac. I love it. Wow!、Yeah. Wow! So. Take me through that journey of、uh, of college, and how in the world did you end up at Harvard? I mean,、uh, so you had a what ten ten twelve bucks in your pocket. You go spend it on clothes. How do you get from there to Harvard? I have to take multiple jobs. I work at the Best Western Hotel, the night clerk, and Burger King、um, in the night uh, uh, cleaning uh, crew. Member the cleaning crew, and I clean people's houses. All at the same time, I was studying in the university for my doctorate degree in laser physics. So that's how I support myself, multiple jobs. And then I oh hold on, hold on. <laughs> hold on. That's that's making a lot of beds, cleaning a lot of toilets, and flip, flipping、yeah. a lot of burgers. Yes. I mean, how in the world did you do all those jobs and go to school at the same time? Yes. So my weekly schedule would be、um, morning seven o'clock in Monday morning, all the way until about nine o'clock at night. Working in the university for my doctoral thesis in laser physics, then nine o'clock I went to Burger King to clean the breakdown machines at the back, very greasy machine. From nine to one o'clock in the morning, and then、um, some weekend evening, weekday evenings I went to professor's house to clean the house. And on Friday, about seven、uh, p.m., starting all the way until Sunday night, ten a.m., I work at Best Western Hotel as, as night clerk、wow. and sleeping only a few hours. During that forty hours time, and you did that for how long? Many years. So I, I have to support myself, and then I wanted to go to medical school because in China I wanted to、uh, become a doctor, but th- I was not even allowed to go to high school in China. So here in America is a free country of free、uh, freedom. So I said, okay, my old dream of wanting to become a doctor reemerged. So I made an appointment with Johns Hopkins admission director. And I walked in.、Uh, Dr. Anderson, very big man. He looked at me. I gave him the resume. I said,、uh, "Here's my resume."、Well, so he said, "Why are you here?" I said, "I'm interested in seeing if I could apply for medical school in America." He didn't even look at my resume. He threw the resume to the side. He looked at me. He said, "Where are you from?" I said, "China." He said, "You know how it's how hard it is to get into American medical school, even for American student. You are from China. Don't waste your time." So he readily discriminated me just because the color of my skin.、Mm. So fortunately, I was not discouraged. I was even more motivated to work harder. So I studied really hard, and、uh, I scored pretty well in MCAT med- medical admission test. So I got into number one medical school, Harvard, and number two medical school, Johns Hopkins. Wow! And then one day, I got a phone call. Guess who was on the other side? Dr. Anderson from Hopkins. He said,、um, "We、uh, uh, we send you, we give you the mission, and we give you the、uh, our school's history, highest scholarship in our history. But we have not got a yes from you. Are you coming?" I said, "I'm looking at Harvard and you, number one, number two medical school in America." He said, at "Hopkins, we respect talents." He did not know I was the same. Chinese student sat in front of him three months prior. He so readily discriminated against simply because the color of my skin. I should have told him that I was the same guy, but my parents always brought me up said respect your teachers, so I didn't tell him. So years later, David, when I was going to write my autobiography from darkness to sight, I thought, you know, Dr. Anderson need to learn something. So I contacted Hopkins and found out he already died then because it was twenty、mm-hmm. some years later. So six months ago. In Vancouver, Canada,、uh, when we're shooting this film, sight under the watchful eyes of about two hundred some people, crew and cast, this young man who was dismissed by the professor said, "You're Chinese, you're no good, don't waste your time." He was supposed to be walk away angry from the set. Something totally unexpected happened. Not in the script, what they call blooper or outtake. I myself hide behind the screen. I walked onto the set. And they would look like、hey, this is not a part of the script. This is what happened. So I went over to the Yang Ming. I said, I put my hand on his shoulder. Yang Ming, I got this for us. So then I turned to the actor who played the professor. I said, Professor, this is Ming from the future. I said, You know what happened to me? So many years ago, you said the horrible things to me. I'm so glad I did not listen to you. So after all these years, I came back today to tell you that. Racial discrimination has no place on this planet. 
So I put my arm on the Yang Ming's shoulder and said, Yang Ming, let's get out here. So, you know, the, how could we prove racial discrimination is wrong? The only way to prove is don't believe it. Fight, stand up, fight against it. And do make something, work hard, make something of ourselves. And then time travel back to tell the person who discriminated us some years ago that you were wrong. And, you know, it's, uh, there's a prevailing thought in our society today. Just because I'm discriminated against, I'm doomed to fail, is everybody else's fault. My life experience has shown that that's not the case. The difference between considering oneself as a victim or a victor is how you see it. What do you do with your own life? Mm. Mm. Wow. Let's talk about uh, now. When you were a, a, when you were a kid, you were not a believer. That's correct. You came to the United States. You were not a believer. That's correct. So what happened? Um, the, the there's a movie, God's Not Dead. Um, it's one of the most successful Christian movies in history. Absolutely. And um, there's a Chinese student character who came to America to study science as an atheist. And then he became a believer. And that character was based on my life story. Mm. And actually, when they recruited this uh, actor to play me in that role, um, Pastor Rice Brooks, who wrote the book, and which made into a movie, God's Not Dead, he actually texted me a photo of this actor. He said, Ming, we got someone to play you. And I look at the photo and said, oh, at least he's better looking. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, the actor flew in, and we had dinner and stuff. So I came after you know, escaping cultural evolution and came to America, I was so happy to be able to study. And I was a staunch atheist scientist. I believe nothing but science. But in medical school at Harvard, I was doing a rotation, studying with a professor. My fundamental belief, the atheist belief about science got fundamentally shaken because I studied the structure of human eye and I found it so complex, the number of neurons in our brain for vision capturing and interpretation, the number of neural cells in each of our heads is greater than the number of stars of, in the entire universe, universe that we ever discovered. Wow. So the, here's the question. So many neurons, there's endless possibilities. How could they combine in such an orderly way for a dedicated function of vision capturing and interpretation. If you based on atheist random collision theory, it would take trillions, trillions of years. So I was in crisis as a staunch atheist scientist that science could not explain a fundamental question like this. How could human eyes, such a complex structure, could form in such a short period of time? In fact, Charles Darwin, in his um, book, you know, the, the Survival of the Fittest, the Evolutionary Theory, he said his uh, Achilles tendon is the eye. He realized that the complexity of eye is so, so um, just mind-boggling that that's the weakest point of his theory, the random collision evolutionary theory without designer. So I asked the professor, I said, um, how science could not explain these questions. And he took me out for lunch and he said, Ming, what's a cross street? I said, that's a car. He said, what's the difference between a car and a human brain? I said, human brain is a little more complicated. He said, uh, can you ima imagine a band, uh, how random pieces of metal assemble itself into a car? I said, no way. Then he leaned over. He said, how about human brain? Right then, he opened a window in my life. Mm. to Christ. He made me realize that the reason why human structure such as I, so complicated, can form in such a short period of time, in such a magically orderly way, is because there's a designer behind it. There's an intended purpose for these structures to form vision capturing interpretation. So I realized that life is not just about science. Life is about science and faith. It's like the two different sides of the same coin. Science tells us what things are. Faith tells us why things are. In fact, 
Uh, then I became a Christian and I started my journey following Christ. And uh, I uh, com- uh, finished my medical training and I realized that what I want to do is to use my skills to do research to help the injured, the elderly, and also to help those who need the most help, which are blind orphan children. So I've dedicated my life over decades to help blind orphan children with the foundation. And uh, sometimes the students today in colleges, they are going away from Christ. They say they don't need the Christ. They just need the science. And I always tell them that, yes, you do need the science. You mm-hmm. cannot be lazy. Mm-hmm. You have to have the tools. You have to have the foundations. But my life experience taught me that science is the foundation, the tools. But a faith in Christ gave me a sense of purpose. What I'm going to use the tools for. In my case, the inspiration to use the, my medical training to help blind orphan children that who needs to help the most, that inspiration came from Christ. Hi, I'm Jackie Dorman. Are you longing to find your soulmate, but you're tired of online dating, singles ministries, blind dates, or even being set up on bad dates by well-meaning family and friends? If none of that's worked for you and you have no idea how to meet marriage-minded men or even truly Christian men who will seek you out for a lasting committed relationship without the head games, then I invite you to join me in my free Married in 12 Months Challenge. Look, there's nothing good or sacred or even noble about sitting in the waiting room. So in this challenge, I'm going to teach you why now is your time to find love. What are the lies that are holding you back? Why God wants you married? the biblical law of attraction, and the tools you need to become a bride. Don't wait any longer. Just sign up for my free Married in 12 Months Challenge today at lovestories.com and you can step into the love story that God has already written about you. That's lovestories.com. And there's always such a tug of war between uh, faith and uh, science. Is, is That's correct. Is that... Um, it, well... well a lot of people say, oh, there's no way the Bible can be real. There's no way that, uh, you know, God created the heavens and the earth and everything happened in seven days. And, uh, you know, there's no way the earth is only, uh, what, 5,000 years old. Or, I mean, you know, et cetera, et cetera. How, how, okay, so you're, you're science buddies. How do you explain that, Yeah, these things? As I said, the um, two, two main messages of the film, Sight, is one, don't be limited by, what, by where you are. Believe and imagine where you could be tomorrow. Second message is we are so unprecedentedly polarized. We need to overcome the polarization to find the common ground. We all had shared humanity on the spaceship Earth. Along the line of polarization, I think the science and faith are so polarized also. People on the science camp, they don't want to have anything to do with faith. They are mass scientists, no moral guidance and principles, no sense of protection for lives. But on the other hand, the other side is equally wrong. People who only believe faith and don't want to study science at all. There's no question that science, you know, is transforming the way we live. Look at just look at our iPhone, right? So I my life's mission as a scientist and also as a Christian, sort of in the middle, I'm trying to bring these two form, uh, camps together. I want to educate the scientists that there's a purpose of creation, there's a purpose of the universe. Yes, continue to pursue science, but with that sense of purpose, with that realization, there's a design. But to the faith camp, I also say you cannot not understanding science the stem cell research, human genetics, and because you're going to be losing your relevance to the modern scientific society today. And you have to be able to willing to reach out across the aisle, if you will, talk to the scientists. And I truly believe science and faith are friends, not foes. It's almost like um, politically blue and white. It's not about going to the blue. It's not about going to the red. It's about trying to find a way to together going forward. And that's my main message about common ground, is how can we overcome the polarization and find the common ground? Actually, Dr. Rice Brooks and I, we spent nearly every Saturday together for like 18 months in a row. Each Saturday, three or four hours studying the scripture and 
uh, we wrote a book together called The Common Ground Bible Study uh, about why is God's calling? You know, the Bible says, blessed are the peacemakers. Why is God's calling for Christians, especially Christians, to lead the way, not to division, but to unification of our country? But also, what are God's teaching in terms of how to find the common ground? We formulated the Common Ground Seeking Steps, S-T-E-P-S. S stands for see the common ground. you got to believe, you have to see. It's like husband and wife. If you always look for differences, you're not going to have a good marriage. But if you turn around, you say, honey, what do we have in common? The marriage could take a different direction, much better. So as T trade places, speak the language of the listener. Over the years, I learned the best way to be a doctor is to speak the language of my patients. And the third, E, empathy. You know, instead of talk, 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 and just kind of shout, yelling, when you meet someone with different opinions, can we apply the SALT principle, S-A-L-T. Start the conversation, ask a question, listen, then and only then, talk. P, perseverance, the price to pay. And final S is put into action. You know who inspired us to formulate this common ground seeking steps? It's none other than Jesus Christ himself. Because his life, his life, Christ's life is the best embodiment of this common ground seeking steps. He saw the common ground with us as human beings. He traded places with us. Could you imagine a better example of trading places than actually becoming one of us? And he demonstrated empathy. You know, the story in the Bible of the women by the well. Nobody wants to talk to her. Christ did. He persevered. He paid the ultimate price by dying at the cross for us. And finally, he put into action. So this Common Ground Bible study we published recently is a full Sunday school study. It, it, the main message is it's an unprecedented polarized time in our country and the world. Christians have an unprecedented opportunity to set the best example, not the worst example, become the worst polarizer, but become the best unifier in a time of division and polarization. And that, that's something that you've put out and that's available now, uh, the Common Ground Bible Study? Yes. And, uh, we started Rice Brooks. Yes. I, 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 would, I would love to uh, do a, uh, a separate uh, podcast and a radio uh, show with you okay. and uh, uh, Rice on that. Th I mean, that would be great to put on a, over the air over a few weeks. Yes, to really engage folks just specifically on on how to do that because you know we hear it all the time, but it's not like well, well, you have it's not like somebody's giving us a direction and, and a way to connect those dots. Mm -hmm. you yes, know, we, we all know how polarized we are. Yes, I always, I always. Compared to college football, you know, I'm an Ohio State guy, and uh, I can't even say the word. Uh, well, I can't say it during the November. It, it's the team up north. Right? <laughs> yes, but but I mean, it's 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 um, it's become very tribal. Yes. You know, the, the, the whole country. You know, we we're in a tribe versus that tribe. Yeah, and we're gonna fight for every yard we got. Yeah, and they happen because of a certain. Um, organizations, individuals with their financial interest building to divide and conquer us. For example, social media. <clears throat> social media is a artificial intelligence driven billion bits calculation supercomputer. So when you have a cell phone, you hit a like or something, Facebook, which you're f on the other side of the screen is a billion dollar machine with billion dollar artificial intelligence whose algorithm is to make you hit more. So advertising uh, uh, fee will increase. And uh, it has no moral guidance, no factual guidance. So whatever you like, they will keep on feeding you more to make you become self-radicalized into an extreme viewpoint that the, um, the, uh, just no longer seek uh, the, the, the balanced view. All of us are 99% elephant as human beings, only 1% logical. So these companies like Facebook took advantage they make us react reflexively, irrationally behave without rational thinking. So we talk about dictatorship in, you know, uh, communist countries. We have another form of dictatorship here in America. That's the dictatorship by these big companies. Not political control, but financial control. They can actually behave, control our behavior by feeding us certain information will make us behave in certain ways. And we need to recognize these forces. 
these polarizing forces mm -hmm. and rather being manipulated. In front of Facebook, I'm not even a human being. I'm just a mathematical data point they're trying to optimize their algorithm mm -hmm. with. We need to recognize there are these polarizing forces for the benefit of our country, for our love for God's blessing in this country. We need to recognize that we need to be intentional. We need to, especially Christians, we have a, such a historical, unprecedented opportunity to set the best example of unifiers, peace fire, uh, to, to show the rest of the world. Christians are the ones who are peacemakers. Mm. Christians are the ones who can bri build bridges across the aisle. Christians are the ones who are willing to talk to people who are different and seek common ground. So what an opportunity to show the power of our faith at this unprecedented, hyperpolarized time, to stand up, mm -hmm. that to show that we as Christians are the unifiers because we have Christ in our heart. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, let's let's uh, let's get into that more in another episode because I'd like to have the two of you together, okay. and talk us through that. That would, that would be amazing. I want to uh, also talk about your uh, inst your foundation. Yes, and I, I know that you have uh, brought people from all over the world and conducted uh, eye surgery. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, one of the one of the folks uh, one of the subjects is featured in your film. Yes. Right? Tell yes. me, tell me about that. Yes, I'm a laser eye surgeon. <clears throat> and I, <laughs> David, I went to school for 31 years altogether. Yeah. <laughs> Till you uh, got it right or what? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I'm really 94. I just age well. Now. Um, I, the reason for the prolonged period is because I was not allowed to go to school in China during the Cultural Revolution. I had to, you know, go in the zigzag route. And I decided I want to be a good laser eye surgeon. So I want to not just know medicine. One side of the story, I want to know laser technology, the other side of the story. So I decided to set out to get two doctor degrees, one doctor degree in medicine, one doctor degree in laser physics. So I could be a good laser eye surgeon. I performed over 55,000 surgeries now, including on over 4,000 other doctors. So that's what I do, uh, you know, I published 10 textbooks um, in ophthalmology, uh, LASIK surgery, CARA surgeries over the years. But in that process, and, 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 and in between, you've had time to do recordings with the likes of Dolly Parton too. With <laughs> yes, yeah, <laughs> in Do your spare time. <laughs> yeah, Dolly is my patient. Actually, um, I did her eye surgery, and one day she walked in. And she said, uh, "Doctor Wang, I'm not here for my eyes." I said, "Oh, what are you here for?" She said, "You play the Chinese erhu violin." I said, "Yes." She said, "Do you want to make music with me?" And I looked at her and said, "Here's a country music legend, you." Want music with me? I'm just a closet, what I call a closet musician. And she said, yes. So uh, she took me to Blue Ocean Studio in music. Well, I saw thousands of little buttons. I never seen uh, all these, uh, you know, music, uh, the sound studio. And she said, my idea is I'm going to sing an American country song and you play your Chinese violin. I remember I mentioned I learned that during Cultural Revolution, that instrument. I said, okay. So I listened to the song. It's an old country song called The, the Cruel War. And after I heard the uh, recording, uh, she said, okay, are you ready? I said, yes. They had the sound mixer, everybody. I have my Chinese running erhu. And I said, can you give me the sheet? She said, I don't have no sheet. I said, do you have sheet for your part of the song? She said, I don't have the sheet either. I just remember it. <laughs> I said, you really want us to compose? She said, yes. So we sat together at a little table like this, David, with Tom, uh, Dolly, and me. And we ima were imagining what would a Chinese violin, an instrument of thousand years old, sound like to accompany a country western American song? And what should be the melody? So it's almost one of those ultimate east-west experiment. But at the end of the night, we composed, I played, we recorded. So in one of Dolly's CD called Those Were the Days, you see those famous country music musicians listed in you know, Alison Cross, Dolly Parton, blah, 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 Ming Wang. <laughs> they say, who is that? <laughs> so that was my experience with Dolly in terms of recording, you know, for her album. Well, wow, that's really something. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I've been doing laser vision correction. Uh, we have patients from all of the United States, from over 40 states and 55 countries around the world. But at the same time, I realized that God has put me on this planet for, with not just vision correction to help people get rid of glasses, improve your eyesight, but also to help those who need the most help. 
In order to do that, I need to develop a better technology to help these folks who suffer injuries and trauma. And um, so I need to study that, but I need to use young tissue. But I didn't want to hurt a baby. Uh, I was a Christian already. I know that we have to pursue science research, but I want to preserve life. People said that science and faith are foes, are not friends. They cannot work together. And I don't, I did not believe that. I thought they got to work together. So fortunately, I, I did not give up. I kept on my research, trying to figure out a way to study fetal wound healing to help injured patients like blind orphan children without hurting a baby. So how do you do, how do you do fetal research without hurting a fetus? Uh, you know, scripture, James 1, 4 said, perseverance completes you. So I did not give up. I kept on trying to find a way to help healing with fetal research without hurting because the fetus does not scar. That's the magic. I persisted in that pursuit for 20 years. I didn't give up. I wanted to research fetal healing to help adults without hurting a life. But then I came across the placenta. You know, the placenta surround the baby before birth, baby is born and it's always discarded after baby is born. So I started collecting those placenta from mothers after giving birth to a child. The placenta is discarded anyway. I got the placenta back in the laboratory. I bioengineered the placenta into placenta amniotic contact lens. Then put these useful healing placenta contact lenses onto older patients' eyes and patients with injury and trauma so they can heal like a fetus. So it's a magical f way of doing fetal research without hurting a fetus. And uh, I got two US patents, and today the amniotic membrane contact lens has been used worldwide in nearly every nation by tens of thousands of eye doctors, mm. and millions of patients have their eyesight restored. The film Sight, based on my autobiography from darkness to sight, features this journey, the discovery of the amniotic membrane contact lens. Wow. So with that technology, I build a foundation to help blind orphan children, and we typically work with missionaries around the world. They identify blind orphan children um, and bring to this country. Uh, the film Sight um, features a story of a six-year-old a, a blind orphan named Kajal from India. Um, she was six years old. She was orphan already. She could see. But one night, her stepmother poured acid into her eyes oh when she was gosh. sleeping in an attempt to make her a blind child singer who would get more money from tourists. No. Kajal, the, the, the movie Sight opened with that horrible scene. And Kajal was intentionally blinded, but then they found out she had no talent of singing, so Kajal was abandoned. We found her in a train station near Calcutta, India, almost died almost five and a half years old. Our foundation brought her to America. The film Sight is about Kajal's journey from darkness to sight. In the process of helping her, I'm, I was able, as the eye doctor, come out of my own darkness of suffering in the past into light as well. And uh, so mm. it was a very, uh, I will not give away the plot in the sure, film. The people sure. need to watch the film side. But the main point is that we have technology and science, and God has intended purpose for us. We need to learn the science and technology. We cannot be lazy. We got master on the science. But we also need to know is the belief in Christ give us a purpose of what we're going to use the science and technology for. In my case, is to use the technology to help those who need the most help, which are blind orphan children. So faith and science are friends, not foes. So tell me about your parents. Uh, were, were they or have they been able to see you uh, go from uh, zero to hero? <laughs> <laughs> they, I, I credit a lot to my parents. They believe in me as depicted in the film side. Uh, I was like seven, six years old. We didn't have enough to eat, but my parents said, study hard, study hard. Uh, the film actually inspires so many parents today that when your kids are in a different situation, see through the circumstance, see something special in them, encourage them, nurture them, build them up, not be limited by where you are now or where they are now, but believe imagine where they could be in the future. So I'm very grateful to my parents. Without them, I would not have today. So several years ago, as, as they were getting older in the late 70s, I moved both of them in to live with me for the rest of their lives. They took care of me as a teenager in my most difficult times. I wanted to take care of them 
in that sunset, yes. Fantastic. That's amazing. That's wonderful. Well, I, I sure appreciate you stopping by the homestead here. I, I mean, I could talk for another hour or two. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and uh, I, I do want to get uh, you back in here with uh, uh, Rice uh, Brooks, your yes. uh your, yes, he's my your pastor. Co-author. He's yes. your pastor. Okay, he's my pastor, and he's the leader of Every Nations, which are the large church uh, group with I think eight hundred nine hundred churches, and with twenty five hundred associate churches in eighty two nations. So, I um I would love to you know relay your mass invitation to Dr. Rice Brooks. He wrote a book, God's Not Dead, oh, which sure. is turning to film. Sure, uh, and uh, actually, Pastor Rice and I are writing a site, the movie site. Bible study right now. Oh, fantastic. Yes. That's wonderful. So now yeah. the f- film is coming out and uh, we're going to, it's a four, uh, actually it's a five, this case, five Sunday school study and about the lessons, messages from the film site and uh, how we can um, uh, become better Christians by uh, being able to share our pain and suffering by not, uh, basically it's the theme is the seeing beyond, seeing beyond your pain. Seeing beyond your circumstance, persevere. Seeing beyond your own culture, being able to relate, connect with others. Seeing beyond polarization, common ground. And ultimately, as human beings, seeing beyond ourselves to realize that there's more to life than what we see. Well, I'm, I'm going to have you back, both, both, both of you back here. That would be Thank amazing. You. Have you together, okay? Thank you. Thanks for, again for stopping by the homestead and uh, just uh, keep doing what you're doing. And I, I'm glad the, the uh, thing with Dolly turned out all right, although, <laughs> uh, although if something would happen to her eyes, we still have her voice. So, but. <laughs> yes. Actually, I'll tell you very quickly, the Dolly, that one time as she, as she saw me and um, um, she said, um, uh, you know, uh, it, 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 I said, um, are you, uh, are you a dancer? Because I look at her, she's a good, beautiful figure, and uh, she's very strong, small lady, but very strong. And I said, are you a dancer? Because I'm a dancer, I habitually look at people as this dancer. She looked at me, she said, I thought you were an eye doctor, why are you looking at my leg for? <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> well, thanks again for stopping by. Thank you. Thanks again, my friend. Dr. Ming Wang has been my guest today on CIA Contagious Influencers of America. The movie is called Sight. It hits theaters on May the 24th. And I guarantee this is going to be moving. Take your family, take your friends. This is so very worth it. Sight hits theaters on May the 24th. And by the way, that's uh, Asian Heritage Month. So um, let's go celebrate that. This has been CIA, Contagious Influencers of America. Do check out our website at contagiousinfluencers.com where you're going to see all of our episodes. And, of course, at keepthefaith.com, we've got all kinds of goodies for you, including our brand-new streaming platform. So you won't want to miss that. Until next time, go out there and live that life in living color because it sure is a heck of a lot more interesting than living it in black and white. I'll see you next time.